Anatomy of a Murder by Robert Traver, Chapter 2. The town of Chippewa lies in a broad, loamy valley surrounded by bald, low-lying granite and diorite bluffs, about a dozen miles west of the town of Iron Bay on Lake Superior. Iron Bay is the county seat of Iron Cliffs County. I used to be prosecuting attorney of Iron Cliffs County. Perhaps the simplest definition of a prosecuting attorney is a DA who lacks a comparable press and publicity. Otherwise, their jobs are the same. There are no radio or TV programs exalting the real or imagined doings of Mr. Prosecuting Attorney. I held the prosecutor's job for 10 years until Mitchell Lodwick beat me. You see, Mitch used to be quite a football star, both in high school and later at the university. The boy was good. He was also a veteran of World War II, while I was a mere 4F from an old scar on my lung caused by an almost losing bout with pneumonia while in law school. The combination for Mitch was irresistible. I was a hero in neither department, so I got beat. Alas, I couldn't run with the ball or tell a corporal from a five-star general, and still can't. Iron mining is the red lifeblood of Iron Cliffs County. The raw iron ore is mined and coasted downhill by rail from Chippewa to Iron Bay on the lake, and thence boated down the Great Lakes to the distant coal deposits and blast furnaces. This makes a handy money-saving arrangement, and for once even nature seems to have conspired on the side of free enterprise. If it weren't for mining, I suppose the county would still belong to the Indians. Instead, it now belongs mostly to the Iron Cliffs Ore Company and the other smaller mining companies, and what's left over, to the descendants of the Finns and Scandinavians, the French, Italians and Cornish, and the Irish and handful of Germans, including Grandpa and Grandma Beagler, who luckily landed here many years before an all-American senator named Patrick McCarran, ironically himself the descendant of immigrants, had discovered that these yearning peoples were henceforth more properly to be known as quotas, and had run up a tall legislative fence around Ellis Island. So at 40, I had found myself without a job, my main assets consisting of my law degree, a battered set of second-hand law books, and some creaking old fly rods. Mitch had been a veteran and a hero. I had been a mere 4F and a bum. For quite a while, I was pretty bitter about being beaten by a young legal fledgling who hadn't even tried a justice court fender case when he knocked me off. For a time, I indulged in wistful fantasies about the plight of the poor left at home 4F in America. Nobody seemed to have a kind word or vote for him. He was the country's forgotten man. He who had remained at home and kept the lamp lit in the window. He who had patriotically bought all these nice looking, nice interest bearing war bonds with his time and a half for overtime, who had stayed at home and resolutely devoured all those black market steaks. He who stayed behind and got a purple nose instead of a purple heart. Yes, he who had occasionally reached over and turned down the lamp in the window and attempted to console all those lonely wives and sweethearts. For a spell, I even dabbled with the heady notion of organizing a sort of American legion of four Fs. We'd have an annual convention and boyishly tip over buses and streetcars and get ourselves a national commander who could bray in high sea and sound off on everything under the sun. We'd even get a lobby in Washington and wave the flag and praise the Lord and damn the United Nations and periodically swarm out like locusts selling crepe paper flowers or raffle tickets or some damned thing just like all the other outfits. 
Arise and fight, ye four Fs, their leader Paul Beagler would cry, were we men or were we mice? By and by the pain went away, however, and as I sat there in my open office window, looking down upon the deserted street, I reflected that I wouldn't take my old DA job back again if they doubled the salary. No, not even if they threw Mitch in as an assistant. Being a public prosecutor was perhaps the best trial training a young lawyer could get, besides being a slippery stepping stone to politics. But as a career, it was strictly for the birds. I fumbled for and ignited an Italian cigar. One never merely lights them, and fell to musing about my old Irish friend, Parnell McCarthy. I have called Parnell McCarthy an Irishman, and perhaps I had better explain. In the polyglot upper peninsula of Michigan, calling a man, say, an Irishman is rarely an effort to demean or stigmatize him. Black eyes lie richly strewn that way, but rather an effort at description, a painless device for swiftly discovering and assessing the national origins of a person's ancestors to the simple end of getting along together. Offense is neither intended nor taken. Thus, a man named Millie Mackey is generally known and indeed more often describes himself as a Finn, though his mother may have been a Cabot and his ancestors on both sides have fought at Valley Forge. And thus a Beagler is hopelessly stamped a German, as often called Dutchman, though some of his ancestors may alternately have toiled and prayed in the leaky galley of the Mayflower. <clears throat> so Parnell McCarthy was an Irishman, though he was born in the shadow of a mine shaft in Chippewa, and had once possessed, so my mother Belle had told me, one of the loveliest soprano voices of any altar boy in the history of St. Michael's Parish. Parnell's Irishness lay more in certain word patterns and in the subtle lilt and cadence of his speech than in any vaudevillian Aaron Go Bra, Mr. Dooley talk. So Parnell McCarthy was an Irisher, as many Finns and Swedes might call him, and an Irishman he would proudly remain to the despair of all visiting sociologists and bemoaners of hyph hyphenated Americans. And all of the UP folk were fiercely American, as any rash doubter ruefully and swiftly found out. As all Americans say, as Rocco Purgatorio, the Italian, who had once broken up a memorable Liberty Bond rally in the Chippewa High School, by abruptly getting up and waving a tiny flag and singing fervently. If you don't like your Uncle Sammy, then go back up to that land where you from, you, you son of beach. Of late years and largely because of his drinking, Parnell had lost most of his clients and had become a sort of lawyer's lawyer rubbing a fitful sort of living in the exquisite drudgery of looking up land titles and interpreting abstracts for the other lawyers and some of the smaller mining companies. Our intimacy had dated from my first year as prosecutor and had begun with a typical Parnellian flourish. A perplexed young state trooper had phoned me the first thing one Monday morning. Mr. Prosecutor, we got a seedy old character over here booked on suspicion of drunk driving. Found him early this morning, standing beside on old Maxwell, wrapped around a tree. Drunker than a skunk. He insists upon seeing you, alone. Who's the villain? I inquired. Parnell Emmett Joseph McCarthy, he says. Claims some dame called Dolly Madison was driving a car. I'll come over, I said, wincing. But who's this here Dolly Madison character? The young trooper persisted. I thought we knew all the old hookers around here. I'll be right over, I said. 
It's a little complicated to explain over the phone. Parnell and I were finally alone over at the jail. Let's have it, Mr. McCarthy, I said respectfully. And please omit Dolly Madison. Parnell finally focused his inflamed eyes on me. All right, all right, young man, he said with great dignity. I'm driving down this road, see? All nice as pie, see? Minding me own business, when all of a sudden it happened. What happened? I asked a little shrilly. As true as I'm setting here, young fella, I'm blinded by the lights of an approaching dragon, he said, and forthwith fell asleep. After I had rallied sufficiently, the officers and I conferred, following which certain arrangements were made whereby we promised to give Parnell the benefit of Dolly Madison, if he in turn would promise to voluntarily give up driving. Parnell and I had shaken hands on it, and both promises had been solemnly kept. And that was how I first got to really know my old friend. I remembered that it had been Parnell who had kept the lonely vigil with me on my last day as prosecutor on that blizzardy day before New Year's, nearly two years before. I had bravely determined to stick out that last day in my office if it killed me. Nobody would be able to say that Polly Beagler had cut and run when the going got tough. But no one had been much interested in saying anything. There were more alluring prospects afoot. One had resolutely to get ready, for one thing, to greet the festive new year in an appropriate state of alcoholic coma. <clears throat> the morning had passed without a single phone call or a caller except the postman, with a heartwarming new year's card from my insurance agent, which I dropped thoughtfully in the wastebasket, and who was followed shortly by an earnest, bow-legged little Cornishman with the war cry, who popped his head in my door with his Salvation Army cap awry, and said in a voice quavering with fervor, May the Lord bless you, and Happy New Year to you, sire. Ah, Happy New Year to you, General Booth, I croaked morosely, feeling very noble and very sorry for myself. Please take the typhoid sign off the door as you leave. Typhoid sign, typhoid sign, the general murmured, mystified, as he picked up his weekly quarter and fled. I grinned evilly at my framed law school diploma on the far wall. I was learning the hard way, something that people who have never held public office can perhaps never, adequ never adequately realize. The feeling of utter forlornness and emptiness that sweeps over a man when he is finally beaten at the polls. And the longer he has been on the job, the worse, not better it is. This morbid feeling is beyond all reason. It is both compulsive and a little daft. One's last friend has deserted him. The entire community has conspired to ridicule and humiliate him. Everyone is secretly pointing the finger of scorn and hate at the defeated one. All day long, desolation was mine, and I wallowed in it. By mid-afternoon, I sighed and pressed the buzz buzzer for Maida. I thought maybe you'd taken the gas pipe, Maida said cheerily as she came in all pert and sassy and shook out her curls and plumped herself across from me with her stenographic pad and a battery of stiletto-sharp pencils. Are you about to dictate Beagler's farewell address? I laughed, hollowly, I hoped, and slid a winkled $20 bill across the desk. No dictation, Maida, rather an errand of mercy. Go over to the liquor store and fetch me a fifth of my favorite pile rum. If Socrates could have his hemlock, I shall have the solace of my whiskey. I waved benignly and looked out at the howling blizzard. Buy yourself a new roadster with the change. Take the rest of the day off to break it in. I'll hold the fort. 
That's the old fight, boss, Maida said, rising. Such lonely courage is touching. The boss and his faithful body. Whiskey for Captain Beagler's chillblains as he stands alone on the bridge and goes down with his ship. His last words were, Saw sub, glub glub. Maida had been in the wax, and she gave me a smart salute as she made ready to go. Pile it on, Maida, pile it on, I said. None but the lonely heart shall know my anguish, I quoted stoically. Don't forget in your travail, boss, Maida said, that the voters of this county have bought and paid for an elegant ten-year graduate course in criminal law for you, and all for free. Where's your gratitude? Just think, for defending just one big case now, you can get almost as much as you got for prosecuting criminals for an entire year. And no more legal freeloaders on your neck reminding you that, yes, I pay my taxes. Anyone who comes into your office now must be prepared to pay through the nose. And I don't have to be nice to them. Boy, I can't wait. I'll be back in 10 minutes with the booze. Thanks for the roadster. Sensible Maida was probably right, of course, as she has an irritating habit of being, and I saw that my main trouble was not so much that I would shortly be an ex-DA, but rather the blow to my pride in losing the job to an amiable young fellow barely out of law school, one who didn't know a bail bond from a bale of hay why not face it? I was smarting, largely because I hadn't been smart enough to quit as a retired champ, like Rocky Marciano, but instead had gone to the well once too often, like good old Joe Lewis, and had finally, like Joe, been knocked out by an inexperienced newcomer, a newcomer inexperienced in everything, that is, but youth. I had sat listening to the howling wind and wondering what had happened to Maida and my 20 bucks when I heard a knock on the door. It couldn't have been Maida because she would have characteristically railed and shouted and pounded or else used her key. It would doubtless be some thoughtless character who'd lurked all day in some tavern, polishing his nose, and then come to gloat over the fading DA. Lord. It would be good to at last get away from that servitude, the thoughtless headlong rush of the great aggrieved multitude. Well, I'd show him what an alert, on-the-ball public servant he was losing. I moved over and opened the door. There stood my old Irish friend, Parnell McCarthy, another Chippewa lawyer, covered with snow and gently drunk. He was holding a damp, brown paper bag, top and bottom, balancing it delicately, as though it contained a piece of priceless statuary. With his bulbous red nose and twinkling gray eyes, he looked faintly like an erring Santa Claus. He also smelled very good. Ah, good afternoon, Paul, he said gravely in his wheezy voice with its trace of Irish accent, in which the Paul rhymed faintly with all. He moved into the room with his bumpy, dignified walk, talking all the while. I come as courier, not a Greek bearing gifts. Met Miss Maida at the foot of the stairs just as I was coming up. She asked me to deliver this. This here now package to you. He studied the bag. Haven't the foggy, foggiest notion what it might contain. That I have not. He shook the bag and listened. Though some mild curiosity, you will observe. He blinked his eyes and shook it again, smiling craftily. Well, now maybe I've got a dark suspicion, or perhaps a wee intuition there, he said, placing the bottle on the blotter in the middle of my desk, his plump hands hovering solicitously. Always glad to be of service to an attractive young woman. He surveyed the paper bag and shook his head. 
perhaps a farewell token of esteem from one of your desolated constituents, he ventured. And then again, perhaps a cabbage. Who knows? I grunted. Suppose the courier takes a peek in the bag, Farn, while I go get some water and glasses. And whatever you find, uncork it. As I stood at the corner washstand in Maida's room, letting the water run cold, I heard old Parnell rattling the bag. His squeals of simulated surprise and his sighs of wild delight, which I suspected were not quite so simulated. Oops. My, oh my, may the Lord save us. Tis a bottle of spirits. That it is. What a remarkable coincidence. And me, just ever after craving a little snort. What a fine gleaming thing it is, too. And old Parnell McCarthy, just in time to have a ceremonial drop with his old friend and colleague, Paul Beebler. Ah, tis a small world. That it is so full of delightful surprises. The old boy is really wound up, I thought, as I stood in Maida's doorway, silently watching him. He was holding the bottle up to the light now, humming the carry dance, executing a few steps of a grave little dance, chuckling softly to himself. At that moment, I envied the man, for Parnell McCarthy possessed that rarest and most precious of human talents, a talent so elusive that it receded only the faster before those who wooed it with more gadgets and toys. The capacity for participation and joy, the enviable ability to draw vast pleasure and enjoyment from small occasions and simple things. For all the old man's show of cynicism, he possessed the sense of wonder and soaring innocence of a small boy flying a kite. Ready or not, Parn, here I come, I said. I filled the jiggers, making a highball out of mine, while old Parnell stood watching the proceedings as rapt as a child on Christmas morning. He took his jigger in one hand and water glass in the other. He leaned over my desk and ceremoniously touched my glass with his, spilling never a drop. Here's to one of the best prosecuting attorneys Iron Cliffs County ever had, he said softly. And here's to a brilliant future for her newest criminal defense lawyer. I shook my head in wry disagreement. Happy New Year, Parn, I said, and we drank. Parnell, as always, took his whiskey straight and followed it with a quick gulp of water. For a man suffering from chronic arthritis, and a little drunk, too, I thought the movements were incredibly swift and dexterous. But then, I reflected, the man had had years and years of practice. Practice, in fact, was Parnell's big trouble. For here was probably the smartest lawyer I ever knew, both the smartest and least successful. Ah, Parnell said, smacking his lips. Tis a fine concoction. For peasants bent on extinction, that is. Parnell and I then talked of many things, past, present, and future. As he usually did when we were alone and feeling mellow, he had spoken briefly and tenderly of his wife, Nora, who had died during childbirth many years before. Old Judge Maitland had told me that Parnell had never been the same after he'd lost his sweet Nora. After a long silence, I had asked Parnell what he thought of my prospects for taking any criminal defense work away from old Amos Crocker, the county's leading criminal lawyer. Do you think there's a chance? I repeated. My question about old Crocker was not idle. Amos Crocker was a spread eagle lawyer of the old school who lived and practiced in Iron Bay, the county seat. Ever since I was a kid, he had been stomping around in and out of court, florid and perspiring, a roarer and fighter from hell. He'd been a constant thorn in the side of my predecessors in office, 
and by the time I became DA, the only noticeable change in him was that he'd lost all his hair and had acquired a red wig from Weber or Fields, I suspected, and a hearing aid, along with a reputation for professional infallibility that was legendary. Humph, Parnell grunted, shifting in his chair, and, I hoped, pondering my question. Old Crocker was known more familiarly to the rest of us lawyers simply as The Voice, or else Willie the Weeper. Besides his booming bass voice, tears were the secret of his success. He wept his way through every trial, and for many years sniffling, lachrymose jurors have been rewarding him and his amazing tear ducts with verdicts of acquittals. He was said to set his fee by the amount of tears he shed, and by the time I had first tangled with him as a young DA, his rate was reputed to have been $500 a pint, and he seldom contrived to weep less than half a gallon. Polly, Parnell had finally said, leaning forward against my desk on his forearms. On any comparative assessment of the relative legal ability and general intelligence between you two, there'd be no question but that old flannel mouth Willie the Weeper never get another criminal defense. He shook his head. And that's no great compliment to you either. Why, that flatulent old windbag, he went on. He's like an old-time Chautauqua lecturer addressing a whole tent. All he does is roar and splutter and bawl. In my considered judgment, he's a dummy and a faker. He's a man of few words, yes, but he uses them over and over. When he gets through arguing to a jury, when at last the relentless torrent of his stout boilerplate rhetoric is turned off, all the judge, the jury, his client, opposing counsel, all are reduced to a state of cata cataleptic trance. I said arguing his cases. I take that back. He never made a real jury argument in his life. All he conducts are filibusters. That's how he wins the cases he does, with that and his crocodile tears. Parnell was warming to his subject, and he stood up. Can't you just hear him carrying on in front of a jury, Polly? Pointing with pride and viewing with alarm. You know yourself, he's got only one stock jury argument in a criminal case, and he's been using that for almost 40 years. Listen to him. Parnell had an unusual gift for mimicry. He hunched up his shoulders and blew out his cheeks, and in a thrice, an indign indignant old crocker stood before me, even, it seemed, to the flaming red wig. He pointed a scornful finger at an imaginary panel of jurors. Ladies and gentlemen, he thundered, you can't guess this man into state's prison. Why, folks, I wouldn't send a yeller dog to a dog pound on this here evidence. Parnell grinned and became himself again. Surely, Polly, you recall those deathless phrases. I nodded glumly. Yes, Parn, I know them all by heart. Parnell reminded me that old Crocker had defeated me only once in the past six years. In fact, the biggest thing he held against the colorful old practitioner was his colossal stupidity. All that man really knows anything about is common arithmetic. He sets big fees and gets them. An examination of the motives that move people in trouble to select the lawyers they do, Polly, would probably fill a five-foot shelf, Parnell continued more slowly, not to mention an insane asylum. You see, the guiltier they are, the tighter their fix, the more apt they are to hire a fulminating old fire-eater like Crocker. Don't you see? If they must ultimately go to prison, as some of them must dimly suspect, they want to go down with colors flying. 
They want desperately to be sent there under the best auspices, on an expensive tour conducted by a hired professional mourner, as it were, roaring and fighting on their behalf. It somehow seems to restore their wavering self-respect, to bolster them to face the ordeal of their confinement. Very interesting, Parn, I said, nodding. Only Parnell could have doped it out this way. Parnell shook his head. In any case, Polly, I've watched this dreary business for many years, too damned many years, and it seems to me that most people in trouble tend to equate clamor and noise with astute criminal defense. It's a sad thing. What the Lord save us it's not only confined to the law. There is a kind of intellectual smog abroad in the land. In nearly all walks of life, we betray our insatiable lust for the mediocre, our terrible hunger for the third rate. You don't suggest I try to imitate old Crocker, I said. Tears and all? I can stick a bean in my ear, of course but I doubt if I could ever find another red wig to match his. Anyway, I'm rather afraid the only person a wig deceives is the wearer himself. I felt my receding hairline. I know, Parn, I said, because lately I've been faced with the problem myself. Imitate that old fraud, Parnell snorted. Hell no, Polly. You shouldn't have said that, boy. You asked me an honest question and I've tried to give you an honest answer. Or did you prefer me to rub your back with this here horse liniment we're after drinking? I'm sorry, Parn. I didn't mean it that way. Talking about liniment, let's have a drink. Here's mud in your eye. I filled his empty jigger. Parnell stood up and leaned over and clinked my glass. Perhaps the surest way for you to break in, boy, is to get a big case, somehow, some way, and then win it. Show the bastards how a criminal case should really be defended, with the head and the heart instead of the arms and lungs. But you got to get and win that first one. Ah, there's the rub. Everybody understands success, especially when it's shouted from the front page of the papers. In the meantime, it's going to be tough, boy. But keep your chin up, Polly, and your sights, too. Parnell gulped his drink and his water, one, two. I shuddered involuntarily and walked resolutely to the door. I'd like to stay and condole with you, Polly, he said, shaking my hand. He pulled on a pair of dark cotton gloves, the kind that workmen buy at corner groceries. You know I'd like to stay and heist a few more with you and keep the vigil, but I, I've got to get home and take me a little nap. I'm attending church late tonight, my annual visit, you know, and perhaps it's only fitting that such a poor communicant as I should turn up at least halfway sober. Good night, boy. Happy New Year and good luck. I stood in my open doorway and watched him walk with dignity to the head of the stairs. He did not look back. I heard him creaking down the wooden stairs and I stood there until I heard the street door squeal shut on its frosty hinges. Then I went back and sat at my desk and poured the remainder of the bottle into a tumbler. To Parnell Emmett Joseph McCarthy, one of the world's obscure Great men, I whispered, downing my drink. Parnell had been right. After the first of the year when Mitch Lodwick had taken over as DA and the county road commission trucks had transferred the last load of accumulated loot from my office to Mitch's, things turned out pretty much as he had predicted. All the important and lucrative criminal defenses still went to weeping, bull-roaring old Amos Crocker. There was this important difference, and one which only made matters worse. Worse for me, that is. Old Crocker began rather regularly to beat Mitch in his criminal cases. Not in all of them, of course, 
but in most. The net result, naturally, was that the old man became even more firmly entrenched, entrenched as the county's leading criminal defense lawyer. Since, in the meantime, I had occasionally to eat and pay Maida, I finally found myself messing around with divorces and padding discreetly into probate court to assist in whacking up the Seden estates between the various taxing authorities and the surviving loved ones. Now, there is nothing professionally wrong with a lawyer pursuing a divorce or probate practice and several things that are right, but there was little or nothing in this practice that drew in the slightest upon my long training in criminal law. I found that the work was placid, moderately lucrative, and safe. But after the drama and conflict of being DA, I also found it to be boring and dull, infinitely and wildly dull. During that time, the only circuit court criminal defense that came my way, I got by court appointment for an impecunious defendant, a young camp breaker with a record as long, well, as long as his face and mine following his conviction. I'm afraid my defense of this case was somewhat less than brilliant. My heart wasn't in it. In fact, I think I saw several more reasons why he should have been convicted than even Mitch or the jury did. I stirred in my seat by the open office window. A cool breeze had risen, the first touch of approaching autumn, and I closed the window and groped my way to the bedroom. So bored and restless had I lately become that I had announced that I would run for Congress that fall. Things had become that bad. But boredom seemed as good a reason as many I had heard for any, anyone wanting to go to Washington, that grand central station of American politicians, about which, as Woodrow Wilson had once wryly observed, in Washington some men grow, others merely swell. I had few illusions about the job, and none about my statesmanship, but at least in Washington, if I got there, I could occasionally shout and wave my arms and perhaps, who knew, chase the daughter of some foreign ambassador round and round the mulberry route. Or would it be those conveniently chameleon Japanese, Korean, Japanese cherry trees? Then Mitch Lodwick had announced that he would oppose me for Congress on his party ticket. But now it looked like we might first meet in the trial of a bang-up murder case. The chips were down. Once again, the young veteran and the aging 4 act were to collide head-on. Go to bed, Beagler, I thought, yawning prodigiously. For tomorrow may be your first big murder case. <laughs>